All right, folks, welcome to Fisk Planetarium. This is our first Science Under the Dome show that is live since the pandemic. So thank you for attending. Yes, in person. Uh, there are a few protocols, so the mask needs to be above your nose and mouth for the whole show. We will have spotters. So be on top of that, please. Uh, my name is Jimmy Negus. I'm a fifth year graduate student in the APS department. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you guys. All right, so tonight's talk is gonna be about science and society. And I'd like to introduce you to our broader Science Under the Dome series. So as you can see, we do science of sci-fi, science and society, and climate change in our backyard. Our next talk is gonna be the week of November 11th, and it's by Annika Rollick, a graduate student in the aerospace department, and she's gonna talk about how humans live and work in space. So please be sure to come to that. All right, let's get to the action. So our amazing navigator is Lizzie Wild. <laughs> Let's give her a round of applause. She will be driving the entire show tonight. It is not easy. And our speaker will be Catherine Bloom. <laughs> so Catherine is a second year graduate student in the astronomy department. <laughs> she studies all things solar related. So she loves the sun. Uh, and when she's not buried beneath fluid equations, she enjoys crocheting cat sweaters, <laughs> being outside with friends, and baking banana cupcakes with way too much chocolate frosting. <laughs> so her talk this evening is gonna be Penrose Tilings, Quasi Crystals, and Islamic Architecture. A brief glance at the tiles on a bathroom floor reveals that squares and hexagons can tile a plane, but pentagons cannot. However, this desired five-sided symmetry can be faked by a class of patterns called aperiodic tilings, which never exactly repeat. Though their, their discovery is credited to the work of Roger Penrose in the 1960s, these tilings have appeared in medieval Islamic architecture, dating back to 1200, which has provided critical insight into their creation. These tilings also provide the mathematical framework to understand the atomic structure of newly identified classes of materials called quasi-crystals. In this talk, Catherine will explore the mathematics behind aperiodic tilings, their appearance in medieval Islamic architecture, and their impact on material sciences. With that, Catherine, please take it away. Can you hear me? Aha. Perfect, it's working. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Welcome everyone to Science Under the Dome, back in person after a year and a half online. Uh, as Jimmy said, my name is Catherine Bloom and I'm a second year graduate student at, in the Astrophysics and Planetary Sciences Department here at CU. But we're not talking about space today, despite standing in a planetarium. We're talking about mathematics. So math is a field that I've found often takes pride in being inaccessible, and mathematicians spend a lot of time talking about how beautiful their work is. But I've often found that they don't take the time to explain why what they're doing is pretty. So today I'm going to use this opportunity of having a captive audience to talk about a mathematical concept that I find beautiful and pretty and playful, and hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll think so too. So the title of this talk is Penrose Tilings, Quasi-Crystals, and Islamic Architecture, and we're gonna talk about all of those things, though not in that order. The thing that ties all of these together is the concept of aperiodic tilings. So periodic tilings that you'll probably see in everyday life on floors and on chess boards and things like that are called periodic because they repeat. Aperiodic tilings don't, even if you put tilings on your flat surface out to infinity. So I have an example of one of those up on the dome that we're gonna be talking about at length. And I'd like you to take a minute and just look at it for a bit. And then after the end of that minute, I'd like to tell you to tell me what you see. All right, what do we notice? Yeah, um, they notice that there are five pointed stars that have more arrays of five pointed stars. And we're gonna return to that concept of five often throughout this talk. Yes. Yes, there are chains, chains of the orange shape, which is a dart, um, that just keep going and don't necessarily wrap around. So today, 
we're talking about putting shapes on a plane on a flat surface, not a domed surface. So despite the fact that this is a planetarium, we're talking about shapes on a flat surface. Um, and we're going to talk about how these aperiodic tilings appear in art and in science. But first, we're going to talk about the mathematics behind it. So we're going to get to both of these images in a little bit. So because we're being mathematicians today, we're going to do what mathematicians do and start with the most basic case, if we're putting things on a plane, we're going to allow ourselves one shape that has equal sides. So another, another terrifying moment of audience engagement. Um, what, what sorts of shapes can you tile a plane with that don't leave gaps or have overlaps um, where you have one shape with equal sides? Yes, hexagons, thank you. Squares. Yes, triangles. And that's, that's it, actually. Uh, triangles, squares, and hexagons. So we have our hexagons on a bathroom floor, and we have, we have some squares on a chessboard. Um, and we have triangles. And so you can tile a plane with a single shape that has three-sided, four-sided, or six-sided symmetry. But you can't do it with any other shape. And in particular, we're going to talk about five. So over here is just a diagram with pentagons. And the reason why pentagons don't work is that the interior angle of a pentagon is 108 degrees. And that does not divide evenly into the 360 degrees required for all of the angles to meet in a way that doesn't leave a gap or doesn't overlap. So this is a geometrical fact that's been known for a really long time. It's been attributed to the ancient Greeks, and I'm sure it appears elsewhere. Um, but five is hard. You can't do this with pentagons. So because we're, again, being mathematicians about this, we're now going to loosen one of our constraints, and we're going to allow ourselves shapes that don't have equal sides or don't really have straight sides at all. So it wouldn't be, wouldn't be a talk about tessellations and tilings on a plane if we didn't talk about M.C. Escher's art. M.C. Escher is known for having a lot of art that's really mathematical in nature. This is no exception. On the left here, we have birds. On the right, we have pegasi, pegasuses, et cetera. Um, and all of these tile the plane quite nicely. We also, if we allow ourselves um, this extra wiggle room, we can tile a plane with pentagons. Um, and there are regular pentagons. They have shapes of different sides. And they don't really fit together in the way that you would expect. Um, and this image, by the way, is from 2015. This is very recent math research. This area of geometry is full of questions that are still being answered today. So what the, speci the specifics of this aren't important, but what is important to note is that pentagons are hard, five is difficult, um, and we will come back to that momentarily. So we've, had, we've loosened the first constraint, and now we're going to loosen the second constraint. We're going to allow ourselves different kinds of tiles as we think about tiling the plane. And if you do this, you can do all sorts of fun things. So this, <laughs> this is a tiling that was actually created by Johannes Kepler of astronomy fame. I know there are lots of astrophysics people in the audience. Uh, and as you can see, he realized that you could tile a plane with pentagons as long as you filled it in with these partial star shapes and big star shapes and diamonds. So this is a really, really neat image, but it also turns out that it's an aperiodic tiling. So in the 1960s, there was a lot of work being done by mathematicians trying to find tilings that didn't repeat. And they found one, and the first one that they found was a set of tiles called the Wang tiles, which featured 20,000 different tiles, which is a really, really large number. I don't know the details of that proof, but they evidently proved that that would produce a tiling that didn't repeat. So then they started looking for sets of tiles with a few that were fewer in number that had this property. And Roger Penrose, who is most known for his work on black holes, I think he won a Nobel Prize last year for that, um, in the 1970s came <laughs> revisited this tile set by Johannes Kepler and showed that this is actually an aperiodic tiling. And if you notice, it does feature pentagons and it has this kind of five-sided symmetry. He came up with a couple more tilings. We're gonna take a look at another one. This one only has two different shapes. Um, we've got this up at the top here, this big, big diamond, and then a different diamond. And as you can see, it still has this kind of five-sided five -sided symmetry. 
So because we're in a dome, um, we're gonna about to do something fun, so this might be a little bit disorienting or mesmerizing, depending on how you feel about spinning things. So these are two of Roger Penrose's tilings, and he came up with a third, which you'll recognize from when you all walked in. This is called the kite and dart tiling because it's made up of a kite and a dart. And this is the tiling we're going to be talking about the most. So Penrose tilings are a subset of aperiodic tilings, and we'll be focusing on this one. So because it's called the kite and dart tiling, um, it features two tiles. Surprise, surprise. Um, the kite is over here, obviously looks like a kite, and then this is a dart. Um, and they are set at very specific angles. Now, you can actually change the angles and um, on the dart and the kite in such a way that you can put them together to have seven-pointed stars instead of five-pointed stars or nine-pointed stars, but we're focusing on five today. So I've told you that aperiodic tilings don't repeat, and now we're gonna talk about how to make them, because you can't just put the tiles together any which way. So the first way that we're gonna talk about to make aperiodic tilings is called the subdivision method. That's over here on the right, and all that means is that you create a bigger version of the tile, like this big dart here, with smaller kites and smaller darts. Um, you can see that some these kites and darts got cut off because you would, in theory, put these together um, as a set. So over here, we have a big kite, and we have another big kite, and you can make it out of little kites and little darts. Um, and that's all that means. I think this method would be a lot more efficient if you were putting these together, kind of automatically generating them on a computer, but it's not the most practical method if you're putting them together by hand. So the second and more fun way to do this, if you are me, is just follow a set of matching rules. So you may have noticed that on this big tiling, there are green lines and red lines, and that's because you need to make sure that those all line up properly to make an aperiodic tiling. So over here on the left are examples of how you can put the kite and dart tiles together in the right way to produce an aperiodic tiling, which is much more fun than a periodic tiling. So I have a little demonstration now where we can actually show you how this works. So I have a pile of kites, I have a pile of darts, we have purple thick lines here, and we have a dotted kind of purple, another purple line, and we just wanna make sure that all of these line up. So if I was going to be periodic about this, I could just put the kite and the dart together this way, and then I have a four-sided shape, and that means that I will not get anything aperiodic, it will just be normal, and it will repeat. Um, and if you notice, these lines don't line up properly. Um, it's difficult to see with the glare. I'm sorry about that. Um, but if we wanted to do something fun or make the tiling that's up on the ceiling, we can put the darts together this way. We can put the kites like something like this and create an aperiodic tiling. And there's all sorts of things you can do with this. I can start with kites instead of darts and see what happens. This particular set of tiles is made out of index cards. Took me 10 minutes. I highly recommend, if you want some mathematical fun in your life, to play around with them yourself. Or I don't know, I'm getting interior decorating ideas, but that's just me because I'm up here talking about math for the duration of this talk. So that's how to make aperiodic tilings. Um, so we, we know how to make them. There's a subdivision method, there's a matching rule. But now we need to talk about how to recognize them. So there are three different properties we're gonna talk about. The first is, as I've mentioned, five-sided symmetry is difficult. You can't really do it with periodic tilings, but you can do it with aperiodic tilings. So anytime you have a tiling that has five-sided symmetry or seven-sided symmetry, anything that you can't do with normal tiles, like three, four, or six, then it's probably a sign that there are some mathematical shenanigans going on. So as many of you pointed out when I asked you to look at this image, we have lots of sets of five. 
which is our first indication that this is an aperiodic tiling. The second big characteristic of aperiodic tilings is that they're self-similar. They have big structures and little structures that are the same. So you might notice they're kind of, you can trace out really large five-sided structures on this dome, and then we can zoom in and see similar structures. So I have um, a much better example of this later on in the talk, but the idea that you can, be particularly because you can make these tilings by subdividing them into smaller versions of themselves, it makes them self-similar. Um, this might be a term that also sounds familiar if you know about fractals, um, where you can continue subdividing them and they look the same. This is a similar concept. So the final property or characteristic that we're going to talk about is that the number of tiles, the ratio of occurrences between the different tiles, is going to approach an irrational number. So if you have a normal periodic tiling, all of the tiles occur quite regularly and repeat, so you're gonna get a ratio like one half or a fourth or four or something like that. Whereas as you add tiles to this pattern, that ratio is going to change and it's going to approach an irrational number, which is a number that cannot be represented by a fraction, which might sound weird because we're taking a ratio, but this is math and there are infinities involved. Um, which is how they can justify something like this. So this particular tiling, if you take the ratio of kites to darts, it approaches the golden ratio. Oh yes, we're moving again. <laughs> um, it approaches the golden ratio, which is a rather famous number in math. It's about 1.6, and it's known for being aesthetically pleasing. So there are lots of irrational numbers that the ratio of our tiles could approach. It just so happens that this pattern approaches the golden ratio for unknown reasons. So the golden ratio is a special number where over here on the left, if you divide this line at a certain point, the ratio of the entire line to the long bit is the same as the ratio of the long bit to the short bit. So this over here, this rectangle is supposed to be divided in an aesthetically pleasing way. Um, this spiral, if you put it, should fit in a box like this and is divided similarly with this bit here and this bit here, create the golden ratio at that division. And it shows up in all sorts of places in nature. So here are a whole bunch of pictures that in theory show this golden ratio spiral. And of course, because cats are excellent creatures, they also abide by this number. <laughs> so the golden ratio pops up in a lot of places and it just so happens that it pops up here, which I think is pretty cool. So what have we learned so far? We, we're talking about putting shapes on a plane today. We know that periodic tilings repeat and typically are triangles, squares, or hexagons, or have three-sided, four-sided, or six-sided symmetry. And if we know that we can have sets of tiles that create aperiodic tilings, which are patterns that don't repeat, we know that we can make them by subdividing the tiles into smaller versions of themselves and by putting them together following certain matching rules. And of course we know that they, there are lots of fives involved or strange symmetries. We know that they are self-similar by zooming in and zooming out. And we know, as I just mentioned, that the ratio of tile, tile occurrences approaches an irrational number. So all of this is from a simple set of tiles. So one last note before we move along is that we're about to spin again. And what I want you to notice is that the pattern doesn't line up. So I feel like at this point you've been taking my word for it that it doesn't really repeat. Um, but this is two of the same tile set overlaid and the top one is transparent. And even as we spin, you can see that it's not lining up even though it looks like it should. So there, there are occasional places where it will line up, but nothing large. <laughs> so one last note about aperiodic tilings. I think they're cool, which is why I'm talking about them, but it's not just me. Oxford also thinks they're cool, and they think that they're cool enough to put on merchandise that they sell. <laughs> So we've got t-shirts, we've got sweatshirts. I personally own this mug over here on the left. Uh, over here on the right is a periodic, an aperiodic tiling Penrose, Penrose like patio that they have. 
And here in the middle is Roger Penrose himself standing on a floor of his tiling. So this is, again, an active area of research. There are lots of open questions about aperiodic tilings. They're not just pretty, they're not just a gimmick. It is something that people are actively thinking about. And it turns out that people have been thinking about aperiodic tilings and actually playing with them for over 800 years. Which brings us to our first change of scenery. So we are currently standing in the dome of the Imam Mosque in Isfahan, Iran. And we're here because we're going to be talking about Islamic architecture and how these aperiodic tilings show up all over the Middle East. So in 2005, Peter Liu, who is a physics graduate student at Harvard, was on vacation in Uzbekistan, I believe, and saw lots of examples of five and 10-sided symmetry in the architecture. And he thought, I, I, I might know what that is, because if we've learned anything so far, it's that if we see pentagons, there are mathematical shenanigans afoot. And we'll be talking about this spandrel at length in a couple of minutes. But first, we're just gonna take a look at a whole bunch of different examples of 10-pointed stars and fun geometries. So there are some in front of you, there are some behind you, um, just all sorts of examples. So in the front here, we see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten points on this star with all sorts of pentagons surrounding it. This one here to the right is similar. We have another ten-pointed star. Um, and I can keep going around and pointing out all of these. So these are all complicated geometric patterns. And for a long time, the method that they thought would be used to create these would be called the strapwork method. And it involves a straight edge and a compass. And the details aren't particularly important for this talk. But it did, re did require a bit of training. So it turns out that around 1200, at least according to this paper from the information that I have, um, there was a shift in construction method. So there's this document called the Tokapi Scroll, and it was meant to be a bit of a handbook for how to create all of these designs. So this here in the middle, you can see these thick black lines are meant to be the big design that you see. And we see pentagons, which we know and love. Um, but you can also notice that there is this really faint dotted red lines that are tracing out shapes. In fact, tiles, which we're talking about today. And you can see them here on the right. It's a bit clear. We have this squashed hexagon tile and a bow tie. Um, and then over here on the left, we can kind of see that there's a decagon and the squashed hexagon again. And it turns out that all of these were created using a set of tiles called Gira tiles, G-I-R-I-H. There are five of them, and they each feature a particular design. And when you put them together, you end up getting the big macroscopic pretty black designs that we were looking at. So we have a decagon with a 10-pointed star design, which we'll see a lot of. We've got a bow tie, a squashed hexagon, a diamond, and a pentagon. Over here on the right are all of these tiles overlaid on the Tokapi scroll, and you can see how each of the designs on the tile create the big structure. And then over here on the left, we have another example of how a 10-pointed star like this would have been created using hexagons, bow ties, and decagons. So I now have another demonstration. So I have a set of gear tiles that I made for myself. Um, and we can put them together in all sorts of fun ways. I, to my knowledge, there's not actually a matching rule, so you can create periodic tilings out of these if you want to, but you can put them together and create all sorts of complicated designs that would be much more difficult to do just drawing freehand. So we can have a bow tie, we have a decagon, we can put a hexagon here, and you can see how easy it is to create five-sided symmetries. We have a pentagon, this entire thing has 10 sides, which is in and of itself five-sided symmetry, and there are all sorts of things that you can do. So this is another fun tile set that you can play with on your own if you'd like. Um, and this one doesn't have any special rules associated with it, so you can do whatever you'd like. So with this tile set in mind, uh, Peter Liu and Paul Steinhardt, who was also involved in this research, went ahead and figured out how a whole assortment 
of these designs were created using <laughs> hero tiles. So this is our to copy scroll again, and we're just gonna go ahead and overlay the hero tiles on top. And it's, you can much more clearly see now that this one on the left was made up of our two decagon tiles with that very recognizable 10-pointed star design. Um, we see our squashed hexagon, our bow ties. Over here in the middle, we see part of the decagon along with our hexagons and bow ties, and again on the right. So now we're going to return to all of those images I put up on the dome earlier, or Lizzie put up on the dome because Lizzie is driving this entire thing. And we're gonna overlay them with the gear tiles that would have been used to create them. So I think it's really clear on this one up at the front to the left, you can see how this entire big star design was a single tile um, and how the bow ties and hexagons would have fit to make something like this. Um, another clear example over here on the right, in the center, all of the designs are filled in. So this, this thing here, this entire thing is a decagon tile, but the design looks a little bit different. So this not only is just, it doesn't only allow you to create more complicated designs, it also is just more practical. You can hand anyone a set of tiles and say, yes, please put these together and create something really, really neat. And actually, you can explain a lot of defects in patterns with these sorts of things by a tile flip, which makes a lot of practical sense. So we know that these are tiles, and we also see that there are five and 10-sided symmetries, which means that a lot of these could be and are aperiodic tilings. And we're going to talk about one in particular, which is this spandrel image that I keep saying that I'm going to talk about. Well, now is the moment. <laughs> so if you take a look at this spandrel, it's pretty easy to see that, you know, there, this would have been a decagon tile and there would have been bow ties here and here. And this big image in the middle shows how this would have been created. So we have a tiling, but I'm also arguing that this is an aperiodic tiling, which is particularly neat. So over here on the right, again, you can see that you have, we have our five-sided symmetry, we have some pentagons, and this here, this big black strapboard pattern is the beginnings of a 10-pointed star. So check one, five means mathematical shenanigans are going on. The second criteria that we talked about was self-similarity, and this is much more easily seen in the center image. So if you take a look at these big black strapwork designs, they seem to tr trace out the designs on larger versions of the tiles that we're using. So even though they were created using all of these smaller tiling tiles that we see up here, the, this does appear to be self-similar because we do have decagons and we do have big bow ties. And if you split them up, like over here on the right, this is how the decagon was split up using smaller decagons, smaller hexagons, and smaller bow ties. And if you follow this subdivision rule, you get this tiling that we see in the middle and over on the right. And it was similar with the bow tie. So this is a self-similar pattern in addition to having five-sided symmetry. So the last thing we have to check off our, our check checklist um, for our aperiodic tilings is we need an irrational number to pop up. And it turns out that if you take the ratio of hexagons to bow ties in this tiling, you get the golden ratio, which should sound familiar because that's what pops up in the kite and dart Penrose tiling. And so with this knowledge in mind, Peter Liu and Paul Steinhardt actually figured out a mapping between this set of tiles, the hexagon, the bow tie, and the decagon, and the kite and dart Penrose tiling that was up on the dome earlier. Mapping is just the fancy math word for relationship, and in this case, it just means that they can create each of these, each of these big gear tiles out of the kite and dart Penrose tiling. So I am going to show you right now. So we can put a couple of kites together with a dart. It's also worth noting that these, this is not following the normal matching rules that we would have for these tiles um, because there are different matching rules um, associated with the bow tie and the hexagon. So this, we have our, we have our bow tie. There we go. You can kind of see it. 
just a little bit. Oh wait, this comes up here. Never mind, I was wrong. We do follow our matching rules. I knew something was off. So we have a bow tie with our kites and darts. And you can also do this with the other two shapes. I just don't have enough kites and darts to show them to you right now. So with all this in mind, they went ahead, did that mapping, and this is the entire spandrel out of kites and darts. And all of the colors are what the gear tiles that they're making up of are. So all of these purple circles are denoting places where there is a defect in the pattern that can be explained by a tile flip, which is something I mentioned a few minutes ago. So what we have here is a design that's been up on a wall since 1453 that is mathematically equivalent to the kite and dart Penrose tiling. It's not just similar, it is actually mathematically the same. There's a really clear relationship between the two. So Penrose tiles, tiles obviously bear the name of Roger Penrose, but this particular aperiodic tiling has been around for significantly longer, which given that it were shortly after Nobel Prize announcement season, I think it's really important to take a little tangent to talk about attribution. Who gets credit for a particular idea? It is almost always a more complicated story than the press will report on or that Nobel Prize committees will recognize. There have been a lot of humans on this planet that have had a lot of ideas, and this is just one case where different sets of people separated by 500 years came up with something incredibly similar. Uh, I think a really famous example of this is that who invented the telephone varies based on which country you grew up in because a number of people invented something very similar at around the same time. Um, and this is just another example of that, except that this spandrel is from 1453 and the kite and dart Penrose tiling is from 1974. So all of this is just to say that credit is complicated and it's always an important thing to keep in mind. So there we have it. We've found aperiodic tilings in art, which is really, really cool. Um, and they've been used for 800 years. But this wouldn't be a science and society talk if we didn't actually talk about an application. So to summarize where, we, where we're at so far, we talked about aperiodic tilings. There is a special pattern that doesn't repeat. We know how to recognize them and how to make them, and we found them in Islamic architecture. So if I take you back to the very beginning of the talk when we talked about nice, regular, periodic patterns. We talked about triangles and squares and hexagons. And all of those have a 3D equivalent that is also periodic and repeating. So for example, our square grid is gonna end up being a cubic lattice. And a lot of these show up in crystal structure. So crystals are simply solids where the atoms and bonds appear in a regular and repeating lattice. So a really common example of this is sodium chloride. Um, sodium chloride can actually be explained using a cubic lattice like this. So this here would be a sodium atom and it would be bonded to a chlorine atom over here. There are a lot of different recognized crystal lattices. Um, there, it's way too complicated to get into all of them now, but the one characteristic that they have in common is that they're all repeating and they're all regular. And up until 1992, that was the definition of a crystal. But it turns out that there is an analog to aperiodic tilings in atomic structure. So this next image is an atomic image of holmium magnesium zinc, I think. And this was discovered by Dan Schechtman in 1982. And the number one thing we notice is that these are all supposed to be atoms and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of them, which as we've learned one thing today, it's that five and ten mean mathematical shenanigans. And so we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what 3D structure could explain this five-sided symmetry. And the answer was that it wasn't a periodic 3D structure, it was an aperiodic 3D structure. And they mapped it out, this is the 2D projection. I'm not gonna go into detail about this just because it gets really complicated really quickly. But the moral of the story is that this is an atomic structure that does not repeat in the way that aperiodic tilings don't repeat. At the time, this was incredibly controversial. Linus Pauling actually said about this that there is no such thing as quasi-crystals, only quasi-scientists. 
but <laughs> this work was recognized. And in 1992, the International Crystallography Organization actually changed the definition of crystal to allow for atomic structures that don't repeat. And these were called quasi-crystals. And for that reason, a lot of the aperiodic tilings that I showed earlier are actually referred to as quasi-crystalline, depending on whether or not a physicist or a mathematician is the one doing the work. So this is one example of a synthetic material that has aperiodic tilings. There are a lot of other examples of synthetic materials. There's this one particularly grainy image on the right. I'm really sorry about that. Um, all of the black dots are supposed to be atoms, and this red is supposed to be overlaying a pattern. So, and we see some pentagons, which is always what we're looking for. Um, for the most part, these show up in synthetic materials, but they do show up in one naturally occurring material, which is over here on the left. This is called icosahedrite, and they think it was from a meteorite. So one incredibly rare naturally occurring material, but for the most part, synthetic. And again, because this is a science and society talk, we have to talk about an application. And it turns out that quasi-crystalline coatings are known for being really resistant to corrosion, so they don't corrode easily. And in particular, a French company decided to create a nonstick pan with a quasi-crystalline coating. It was supposed to be more durable than Teflon. You could put it in the dishwasher. Very exciting. However, salt etches the coating, which is very impractical if you're cooking. So they were not in production for very long. This image I pulled from eBay, someone was selling this as a very rare item. I think Dan Schechtman himself owns one because that is a pretty neat thing. Um, so, but this particular application of quasi-crystalline coatings, not that useful. But they are really, really useful in situations where you want to reinforce steel. Um, it reinforces steel like armor. And because it's resistant to corrosion, um, quasi-crystalline coatings are often used in surgical tools, knives, things like that. So there is an application to quasi-crystals. We have now covered this. However, I don't want you to walk away from this talk thinking that aperiodic tilings are, y are only valuable because they, show they have some limited utility in a nonstick pan. They're valuable because humans, for over 800 years, have been actually physically playing with these tiles. They've been worth their time. So they're valuable because, you know, mathematicians thought that they were fun and played with them. They're valuable because architects in medieval, in, in medieval Islamic architecture decided, hey, this is really, really cool. Let's put it on a wall. And they also do show up in quasi-crystals, which is really, really neat. So I don't know. Aperiodic tilings are important because I think they're important, because other people think they're important. They're really pretty. So anyway, what, a, what have we talked about today? We've talked about putting shapes on a plane. We've talked about how aperiodic tilings don't repeat. Hopefully, I've convinced the gentleman over here that they don't repeat. We've talked about how you can make them using matching rules or subdivision rules. And we've talked about how to recognize them. Five means aperiodic tilings, also seven, also nine, uh, and that they're self-similar, and that they, the occurrences of tiles approach a, an irrational number. And we found them in Islamic architecture, and we found them in quasi-crystals and in material science. So hopefully I have you convinced that this particular corner of math is beautiful, and that even though math is weird geometries and abstract, abstract material science and things like that, it can also be really, really pretty, and it can also be a place to play. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, we have one more, one more, we're taking the dome for one more spin. So again, this might be a little bit disorienting. Thank you very much. For Catherine. Awesome job, Catherine. Thank you again.